19. We come now to a section of exceedingly great news. We've been looking at judgment, and, uh, but tonight we come to a section where you and I are, I trust, longing for this day. We're looking forward to this day. Revelation 19 and verse 1, it says, After these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven, saying, Alleluia, or Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. Again they said, Alleluia, her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God, who sat on the throne saying, Amen, Alleluia. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage supper of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Lord, tonight as we come to the study of your word, we ask you, Spirit of God, guide us into all truth. Anoint us, God. Anoint us, reveal your word to us tonight. And Lord, I pray that you would minister unto us. And I pray, God, that great hope would fill our hearts. I pray, God, that a great longing would fill our hearts, that we would be able to say, even so, come, Lord Jesus. That we would long for your coming, God. That we would be those who are ready and prepared, uh, watching for you to come. We thank you tonight and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Tonight as we continue our study in this book of Revelation, we have seen over the last two times that we have been together in Revelation 17 and 18, we have looked at and considered the destruction of Babylon, the destruction of that world system and the destruction of that last day stronghold of human rebellion against God. And as we looked at these events described in God's word, I asked you a question. I asked you this over the last several times we've been together. What kingdom are you living for? Are you living for Babylon? Are you living for the great harlot? Are you living for the world and the world system? Is that where your hope is? Is that where your trust is? Is that what motivates you and is that what influences you? We've seen in God's word that that world system, Babylon, the great harlot, that that system is coming to an end. How many understand? You realize tonight that the world system... Human rebellion, these institutions and kingdoms of men are on their deathbed. They are on their way out. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 2. You know this verse, but we're going to read it together. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. 
the Apostle John in his epistle, it says in 1 John 2 and verse 15, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world, and the world is passing away. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. The world is passing away. The kingdoms of this world are being shaken right now. Do you understand that? There's a shaking going on. Yet once more, and I will shake all things is what the author of Hebrews said. But you and I are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. That is an eternal, everlasting kingdom. As we've been looking, we've been considering this. We've seen the end of the world system. We've seen God's judgment poured out on the last day kingdom that will be in control. We've seen his judgment. We have seen, listen, that God is going, God is going to judge. And his judgment will be full judgment. He will recompense everything that has been done. This is what we have seen all through this last book of Revelation, this last book of the Bible. No one, listen, no one is getting away with anything. No one. No one is getting away with anything that is being done. Every deed, everything done will be brought under the righteous judgment of a holy God. David said in Psalms 9 and verse 8, he said, He shall judge the world in righteousness and he shall administer judgment for the peoples in uprightness. Paul said that there is a day appointed in which he will judge the world in righteousness. Revelation chapter 6, you know, the souls crying out under the altar and they're crying out how long, how long. There's going to come a day when it will be fulfilled. They, judgment will come and it will be poured out. God's wrath, his judgment is coming. And this is the time that we've been looking at, the time of the tribulation. You realize that there will come a day. Right now, listen, right now something is restraining all of this. We read in 2 Thessalonians on Sunday that there is a restrainer right now that's literally holding back the Antichrist. There's, there's something that is restraining right now, but then there's going to come a day when that which restrains will be taken out of the way and the man of sin will be revealed. Right now we're in the period where it is being restrained. Right? Right? But there's going to come a day when that will be removed. You will see the Antichrist revealed. You will see this last day kingdom begin to take shape. You will begin to see this. And you will see how God will bring a complete end to it. And that's what we've looked at. That's what we've been studying in Revelation 17 and 18. But as we come to Revelation 19, we see something joyous, something that all who belong to Jesus are waiting for, something that we are longing for, all who are born again and washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. This is a day we are looking for because we have been purchased for this day. We have been bought for this day. He bought you. You realize you belong to him. You are his. And there's going to come a day when we will be united with the bridegroom and we will experience the marriage supper. That is when his people and the bridegroom come together 
and we are in his presence. That's what John describes to us here in Revelation 19. The marriage supper of the Lamb has come. And this is what we are going to consider tonight. Look at this in verse 1. It says, After these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. Here we see number one, heaven praises God for his salvation. After these things, it says, so we know we've gotten familiar with that phrase all through the book of Revelation. So we understand this is a change of scenery. He's at, in Revelation 18, he's looking at heaven. He's looking, I mean, he's looking at earth and the destruction of Babylon. But now he's in heaven. The scene changes. And he says, after these things, John sees this multitude and he hears the voice of a great multitude in heaven. A multitude that cannot be numbered of angelic beings, of the redeemed, of God's people. Can you see that multitude that has been born? again ever since he died on the cross ever since he rose again can you see the redeemed from all centuries standing in the presence of God here they're crying out they're saying hallelujah hallelujah this is the first time in the New Testament that hallelujah is used this is the first time where the word or the language hallelujah is cried out. And hallelujah, you know what it means. It's the Hebrew for praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Here is the only time in the New Testament it is used. Praise Yahweh. Praise Jehovah. You see this used first in Psalms 104 where David uses it and then Psalms 113 to Psalms 118. You see it over and over again. But here you see those in heaven, all tribes, languages, and tongues crying out, Hallelujah. It's a saying that is the same in every language. Hallelujah. If you go to China, there's not another word. They say what? Hallelujah. If you go to South America, there's not, they don't have a different word. They say hallelujah. Wherever you are. It's an old story of a, two missionaries on a boat going to different countries and they both spoke different languages and they were in the midst of a bunch of people that were unsaved and they wanted to fellowship with, e with each other and they didn't know each other's language. So one of the Christians said to the other Christians, Hallelujah! And they replied, Hallelujah! Amen! It's a universal praise unto God. Amen? Hallelujah! Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord. And this is what John hears. Hallelujah. Salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. You see this multitude praising God for his salvation. God is our salvation. Salvation belongs to God. He is the author of our salvation. He is the finisher of our salvation. He's the one that purchased our salvation. He planned our salvation. All glory belongs to Him. Jonah said He is the God of salvation. Amen. Salvation belongs to the Lord. We are saved because He is our salvation. Salvation and honor and glory and power belong unto Him. It's all His. It all belongs to Him. All praise belongs to Him. We praise Him for His salvation. Glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. 
belong to Him. We see in verse 2, they praise Him for His righteous judgment. For true and righteous are His judgments, because He has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and He has avenged on her the blood of His servants shed by her. Heaven praises Him for His righteous judgment. True and righteous. True and righteous is what we will proclaim. John is seeing us and hearing us. We will be standing there crying out, True and righteous are your judgments. When God brings judgment, there is no flaw. There is no mischaracterization of anybody. There is no angle left out where he doesn't know all angles. There is no side that is not known. There is nothing that is unjust in his judgment. As Abraham cried out all those long years ago, will not the judge of all the earth do right? God will do absolutely right when he judges. There will be no injustice. There will be no flaw. Nothing will be left out. No angle not considered. It will be true and righteous altogether. Amen. The one who has eyes like a flame of fire sees through everything. The word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. All things are naked and open. Nothing is hidden. Amen? Everything. That's why I say to you tonight, it is pointless to be a hypocrite. Stop playing games. He sees everything. If you've sinned, confess it. Confess it. Amen? He sees it all. Amen? You're not hiding anything. Right? Come to me. And confess your sin. He sees it. Amen? And He will bring true and righteous judgment. For He has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth. He has judged and exposed it for what it really is. You and I tonight can rest assured that those who long for justice, for equity, and for God to vindicate His name and bring glory to His name, He's going to. He will be glorified. The glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. He will be glorified. Jesus said... That there is going to come a day, Paul said, that there is going to come a day when every knee will bow. Every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, when the Messiah's kingdom comes, there will be complete justice. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 9. It's in this prophecy that we preach about around Christmas time. We see what is going to characterize the kingdom of Christ. Isaiah 9 and verse 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. 
and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice. From that time forward, even forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. He will establish his kingdom, his throne, with judgment and justice. He will avenge the blood of his servants. He will bring vengeance. Romans 12 and verse 19 says, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. He will, he will bring judgment and avenge the blood of his servants. Verse 3, in Revelation 19, again they said, Hallelujah. Her smoke rises up forever and ever. We see a second hallelujah for God's judgment. It is final. Their smoke rises up forever and forever. All earthly rebellion is over. And then we see in verse 4. Again they said, and the, verse 4, And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God, who sat on the throne saying, Amen, Alleluia. And here heaven praises God because he reigns. We see again those 24 elders that we've already seen in Revelation 4 and Revelation 5. These 24 elders representing all the redeemed. The elders representing all of God's redeemed. Some believe they represent the 12 tribes of the children of Israel and the 12 apostles, all of the redeemed, old and new covenant. All of redeemed humanity, everybody that is saved. And there you see the four beings that we looked at that are always around the throne. The four living creatures, the ones that are there crying out, Holy, holy, holy. The ones that we saw a glimpse of in Isaiah 6 that were in the presence of God crying out, Holy, Holy, Holy. In Revelation 5, we see the same beings around the throne crying out, Holy, Holy, Holy. And here they fell down and worshipped God who sat on the throne and they said, Amen, Hallelujah, Amen, so be it. It is so, Hallelujah. Verse 5, it says, a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants and those who fear him, both small and great. A voice, most likely one of those four creatures, cried out telling those around the throne to praise God. All of his servants, those who fear him, both small and great. Verse 6, it says, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters and the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. John hears this great multitude as the sound of many waters. That is, it's all-encompassing. Can you picture this? Can you picture this? Can you take just a holy imagination standing around the throne with a multitude that you, you can't even number? You know what we do is just dress rehearsal for that day. You, you know, you and I, we gather together a few times during the week and we worship. It's like a picture of what's to come. We come together, we're united together, and we begin to worship the Lord and to sing unto Him and to lift up our voice. 
But there's going to come a day when we're finally there, when we behold him. And we're crying out, hallelujah, hallelujah. Can you imagine? We'll have to have a glorified body because our heart would burst on the inside of us. We wouldn't be able to take it. The Word of God tells us that in the presence of God, David said, in His presence is fullness of joy. Can you see that? That, that we're not seeing in a mirror dimly anymore. We're there face to face. We're not looking through a veil like thinly. We're not, we're not just getting pictures of it. We're there. We're there. We see it with our eyes. We get to behold it. And we look upon it. And the Word of God says that in His presence is fullness of joy. Think about the happiest you've ever been. It won't even compare the joy that you will feel. There will be no cause for unrest, no anxiety. It will not be over the next day. It forever. It will last forever. Amen? Joy, eternal joy. They're crying out, this multitude like the sound of many waters, like thunder peals going off. That's, that's how loud it is. That roar of a crowd crying out, hallelujah. For the Lord God omnipotent reigns, the almighty God reigns. The Lord God omnipotent, the one who has all power and all authority, who works all things after the counsel of his own will to the praise of the glory of his grace. We will be in his presence. And that prayer that has been prayed ever since Jesus taught us to pray it, your kingdom come, and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven will be answered. Amen. We will be in that multitude. And then verse 7. He describes to us the marriage supper. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. Here we see the arrival of God's reign. And we see the long-awaited marriage of the Lamb to his bride, which is the church. This imagery of marriage... It's been used throughout God's Word to describe God and His people. It was used in the Old Testament as God depicted Israel as His spouse, as His bride. Turn with me to Isaiah 54. In Isaiah 54... Verse 5, it says, For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. He is called the God of the whole earth. For the Lord has called you like a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, like a youthful wife, when you were refused, says your God. For your mere moment I have forsaken you, but with great mercies I will gather you. Hosea 2, turn with me there. Hosea 2 and verse 19. God is speaking to Israel and he says, I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice and loving kindness and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness and you shall know the Lord. We see this used in the New Testament to describe the church. The church is 
described as the bride of Christ. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians 11. This is what the Apostle Paul says. In 2 Corinthians 11, it says in verse 2, Paul says, For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. 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 My goodness. For I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Ephesians, turn with me to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, it says in verse 25, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church. And gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. That he might present her to himself as a glorious church. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. But that she should be holy and without blemish. Christ is referred to in the gospels as the bridegroom. You see this language of. Marriage used all throughout the Gospels. Christ is depicted as a bridegroom that is coming for his bride in the night. And they must have oil ready for the bridegroom so they can go out and meet him. You see the marriage of the Lamb points us. It points us to the consummation of the new covenant. The new covenant began, it began when he died and rose. When he poured out his spirit. It began, he he called us to himself. We are engaged to him, we are a spouse to him right now. We have been a spouse to Christ. But there's going to come a day when the bridegroom comes and takes his bride. And they are united forever, never to be separated. Amen? We see this used and Christ uses this language, but we must understand how marriage was in biblical times. You see, there were several aspects to a marriage in the word of God. Marriage in biblical time began with the betrothal. And when somebody got engaged, it was a legal binding. They were, by law, at that time, legally married. But they separated for a space of time sometimes a year, and they would keep themselves pure waiting for this marriage to consummate. And when the marriage would finally come, or the day would finally come, the groom would go to the house of the bride, get his bride, and take her back to his house where a feast would be prepared. And a celebration would begin. You realize right now, you and I have been purchased with the blood of Jesus. We have been espoused to him. We are the bride of Christ. He has given us the greatest engagement ring that can be given, the Holy Spirit. He has given us an assurity that we belong to him. This Holy Spirit that lives in us. But there is going to come a day when Jesus, you know what he said in John chapter 14? I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place, I will 
come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. You realize there is going to come a day when you and I are going to hear the sound of a trumpet. We're going to hear it sound, and the bride of Christ is going to meet the bridegroom in the air, and then we're going to go back to heaven, and we're going to feast at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen. Amen. The marriage of the Lamb has come. The marriage feast. Christ is coming for His bride. We read in verse 8, it says, And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. She was granted to be arrayed in fine linen. It says there, clean and bright, glistening. Was clothed. He provided this. He clothed us with fine linen. We're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. We see also this clean and bright and fine linen is also described as the righteous acts of the saints. It's the righteous acts of the saints. As Paul said, by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The righteous acts of the saints... One day we're going to shine forth in that fine linen. And then we read in Philippians chapter 2. I love this verse. I've heard this verse quoted many times, just half of the verse. Just half of it. Turn with me to Philippians 2. But you've got to, you've got to pick up I've heard verse 12 quoted a lot, but you've got to pick up verse 13. It says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work it out. Walk, that is, walk it out. Live, live it out. Live out your salvation. With fear and trembling and godly reverence for the Lord. Walk it out. Live it out. But look at what verse 13 says. For it is God who works in you. It is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. We work out our own salvation for it is God that is at work in us, both to will and to do it. The will and the doing comes from Him. Man, that that even my holiness and my ability to mortify my members which are on the earth, putting it to death by the Holy Spirit, that is His work in me. I have nothing to glory in. I have no boasting in. I have nothing to brag about. It is Him who is at work in me, both to will and to do for His good pleasure. And we're going to be arrayed in fine linen, the righteous acts of the saints. Amen? We see in verse 9, John makes a colossal mistake, verse 10, but verse 9 he says, Then he said to me, Write, 
He tells John to write. As if he comes back to where he was and he says, write it. Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. Blessed are those, this is the fourth beatitude in the book of Revelation, the fourth blessing pronounced. Blessed are those who are called to this marriage supper. And then he said these words are the true sayings of God. These are the true sayings of God. You can take it to the bank. You can count on it. Write these words. Write it down. Blessed are those who are invited, who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's us, church. He's calling. He's calling. He told that parable in the Gospels about a, merry, or a, a feast that was made and he sent out his servants to call, come, come to the feast. Some people said, no, you know, I'm too busy. I got this going on, I got that going on. He said, go out into the highway in the hedges. My house has to be full. He goes out and he gathers them in. He says, all is made ready. He's calling. Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. In verse 10, John, here's where he makes a mistake. And I fell at his feet to worship him. Perhaps he's overwhelmed by all that he's seeing, all that's taking place. He falls down to worship this messenger. And he says to him, see that you do not do that. Stop, don't do that. He tells him, I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. Worship God. He's the only one we worship. Amen? We don't worship angels. We don't worship anyone else. We worship God. And then he says, he makes this statement, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That is that all, all of the Old Testament, all of the prophets, the Torah, the wisdom literature, the histories, all of it, all of it points to Jesus. The preaching of the apostles, the letters of the apostles, all of it proclaims Jesus. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. It all points to him. And tonight I want to close by reading an excerpt, or excerpt from a man by the name of James Hamilton. I want you to listen to this because he's talking about the marriage supper of the Lamb. And here's what he says. Never has there been a more worthy bridegroom. Never has a man sacrificed more for his beloved. Never has a man gone to greater lengths, humbled himself more, endured more, or accomplished more in the great task of winning his bride. Never has a father more wealthy planned a bigger feast. Never has a more noble son honored his father in everything. Never has a man treated his bride to be more appropriately. Never has a more powerful pledge like an engagement ring been given than the pledge of the Holy Spirit given to his bride. 
Never has a more glorious residence been prepared as a dwelling place once the bridegroom finally takes his bride. Great will be the rejoicing. Great will be the exaltation. There will be no limit to the glory given to the Father through the Son on that great day. Never has a bridegroom done more to qualify his beloved to be his bride. Never has a bride needed her bridegroom more. Never has there been a wedding more significant than this one. Never has a prince with more authority taken a bride with less standing. Never has a bride had her prince die for her, rise from the dead for her, and give to her his own standing before the Father. Never has a bridegroom loved his bride more. Never has a bride waited as long for her bridegroom. Never has a bride sung more songs to her beloved. Never has there been a wedding with more guests than this one will have. Never has a wedding taken place on a more mon momentous occasion, the end of the overlapping ages and the ushering in of the kingdom. Never has there been a marriage like this one. Amen. We praise you, Lord. Let's pray tonight. Father, we love you. We praise you, God. We worship you. God, thank you for the lamb. Thank you for the lamb that was slain. Thank you, Lord, that you've purchased us with your own blood. You've given us the Holy Spirit as the down payment of our inheritance. Thank you, Lord, that you are coming again, that you will descend from heaven. You will come for your bride. You will call her forth, and we will meet you in the air, Lord. God, help us to live with expectancy of that event. And help us to live understanding we've been called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.